Today on the show, we have Denny Kahn. He's the American Homebrewers Association Governing Committee member, and he also has a website at dennybrew.com. Denny, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here, Brad. Nice talking to you again, man. Yeah, enjoyed meeting you at the American Homebrewers Conference this year. That was fantastic. Yeah, it was a good one this year for sure. So, uh, so Denny, you've been an icon in the homebrewing world for uh, for quite some time now. I think you said 14 years you've been active. Um, mm-hmm. How'd you get into brewing? Uh, pretty much the same way as a lot of other guys. Uh, my wife gave me a kit of equipment and ingredients uh, for my birthday uh, back in 1998. Uh, I had a friend who'd been brewing. I didn't really think that I had uh, the room to do it. He showed me how easy it was. So, uh, you know, I did it. Uh, the kit came with uh, ingredients for a pale ale. It turned out great in my first batch, and I was hooked. Now, uh, a lot of homebrewers eventually make the leap from uh, from extract into all grain. And uh, can you walk us through some of the basics of, of traditional uh, uh, mashing and fly sparging? Obviously, we're going to talk about batch sparging in just a minute because that's your your area of expertise. But can you can you sort of sort of walk through some of the basics here? Uh, sure. Uh, the traditional method. I mean, you know, traditional going back maybe a hundred years. Um, is uh, that you out, you mash the grain by mixing uh, crushed malted barley with uh, hot water. You let it sit for a while, and you start running that off from your mash tun, whatever that is. And uh, as you're running off that mash, you add more hot water into the mash tun, trying to keep it uh, an inch or two above the grain bed. Uh, that is your traditional sparge called fly sparging, which is a kind of a shortened way of saying on the fly. So you're adding you're adding water in at the same rate that the water is going out. Uh, that was kind of uh, brought about when brewing became more of an industrialized thing because it really helps to maximize uh, the amount of sugar that you can get out of the mash and make sure that you can get uh, every last little bit out and uh, which of course leads to uh, increased efficiency and uh, means you get more for your money when you're in a commercial situation Uh, before that traditionally you know for for many many years uh, brewers did uh, maybe no sparge whatsoever, um, or they uh, they did uh, something that was kind of akin to uh, what we call batch sparging now. Now, uh, you've you've long been known as an expert in batch sparging, and you've written a whole bunch of articles about it. Uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about how batch sparging came about? Yeah, well, you know. Batch sparging is kind of a variation on a method, an old English method called party guile brewing, where uh, you run off the mash into one kettle, add more water to the mash tun, and uh, then run that off into another kettle and make a second uh, beer of a lesser of gravity. Uh, so, uh, you know, batch sparging, what you do is you actually combine those two runoffs in the same kettle. Uh, so that uh, you know you have you have one wort with both of those runoffs in it. Um, I learned about batch sparging, I guess, by reading the old Homebrew Digest uh, mailing list newsletter uh, about 14 years ago. The uh, the late great George Fix mentioned that he had come across an old uh, German technique uh, of batch sparging and. Uh, wrote a little bit about it there and shortly after that I managed to run across a paper that a guy named Ken Schwartz had presented at the uh, 98 or 99 uh, National Homebrew Conference in Portland where he talked about uh, the batch sparge technique and uh, a lot of the math that I refer to actually comes from his paper and uh, I I sent you a link to that so I'm hoping we can get that posted along with this interview for people to look at. Um, I I spent some time uh, emailing back and forth with Ken. He came up with a spreadsheet for uh, adjusting recipe formulations for batch sparging 
and I would feed him my data from uh, my brews and stuff. And uh, one of the interesting things that I found was that he was assuming that batch sparging was going to be so much less efficient that you would need to adjust your recipe because of it and uh, included a, a grain scale up factor to, to do that. What I found was that by using Ken's grain scale up factor, I was overshooting my original gravity most of the time. So what I really discovered my takeaway from that part of it was that batch sparging can be every bit as efficient as any other kind of sparging. It just depends on your own uh, brewing system and how you do things. So, you know, I started, it, uh, it was great. I'd fly sparged a couple batches already and found that it was a, a really tiresome process that uh, I didn't really enjoy very much. So I tried batch sparging, got great results, started talking it up online back in the early days of the rec.crafts.brewing uh, Usenet group and uh, encouraging people to try it. And the more people that tried it, the more people switched over to it. So Danny, can you tell us some of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, batch sparging versus more traditional methods? The advantages are easy. Um, number one, it takes less equipment. Uh, you don't need to necessarily have a separate hot liquor tank to batch sparge. You don't need to use a gravity fed system. You don't need to necessarily have pumps or anything like that. Um, I'm uh, I'm probably one of the clumsiest people in the world, so you know I pretty quickly concluded that a gravity-fed system would not be good for me because having you know a bunch of hot water up above my head was just an invitation to hurt myself. <laughs> so um, you know, so I've you know, and it's it's also quite a bit faster in traditional fly sparging. You're rinsing the sugars that are left in the grain. In order to do that, you need to maintain a fairly slow flow rate through the through the grain, and fly sparging uh, a five gallon batch of beer can easily take an hour or more. Um, batch sparging, you're draining the sugars out after making sure that they're all in solution in the wort at the same time, and basically it takes me. I collect about seven and a half to eight gallons of wort for my average five and a half or so gallon batch and to collect that seven and a half to eight gallons of wort takes me a total of 15 minutes from the time i start the mash runoff until the time that i finish the sparge runoff so it is you know really really a fast thing um disadvantages you know from my point of view there aren't any I guess the one disadvantage that you can say that exists is that uh, you may get a slightly reduced efficiency via batch sparging, and that is really relative. I uh, I tend to average right around 85% efficiency uh, once I, the beer gets into the fermenter. And that's really pretty much on par with many people who are fly sparging. Uh, so, you know, worst case is it, you know, may cost you an extra bag of grain a year. So you're going to be paying, what, another $28, $30 a year to batch sparge, <laughs> use less equipment and take less time. And to me, that seems like a, a, a really good trade off. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess the other uh, advantage of batch sparging is that it eliminates any problems that your loudering system might have. Uh, for a fly sparge system, you really need to have a well-distributed loudering system so that when you're sparging, uh, the sparge water doesn't channel and all go down through one little spot in the grain and leave sugars behind. Because in batch sparging, you're getting all those sugars into solution and then draining them out. Uh, it really removes the laddering system as a variable. As a matter of fact, uh, for 14 years and 407 batches, I've used a picnic cooler with a toilet hose in it, and I'm not about to change. <laughs> That's great. Uh, can you walk us through some of the basic, uh, the basic process involved and some of the equipment involved in batch sparging? 
Um, sure, and I guess I'll just kind of use my system as an example because uh, it's about as basic as you can get. Um, I have a 48 quart Rubbermaid cooler that I've removed the spigot from. I inserted uh, the the bung from a a mini keg. I don't know if they're sold much anymore these days, but they may still be around. And, and you know, if you go to my website, dennybrew.com, there are step-by-step -step instructions and you can see how all this works. But I put the, uh, the mini keg bung in the hole where the uh, spigot in the cooler was, run a piece of vinyl tubing through that. On the outside of the cooler, I put in just a little uh, nylon twist valve into the uh, vinyl tubing and uh, put another piece of tubing on that that runs down and that can run into my kettle. On the inside of the cooler, where the tubing comes through the cooler wall, I uh, use a hose clamp to attach a stainless steel braid from, yes, a toilet hose. It really is. Um, with my uh, typical finesse and workmanship, I use a hatchet and chop the ends off the toilet hose. Uh, then, then here's the trick that I'll tell you right now that a lot of people can't figure out. It's like the old Chinese finger cuffs uh, trick when we were kids. You push each end of the, the braid in towards the middle. It makes the braid expand and you can pull out the rubber hose that's inside the braid. So you fold one end of that hose over or, or the braid over, uh, whack it a few times with a hammer to seal it. The other end gets hose clamped to the vinyl tubing. There's your mash tun, cheap and easy. Uh, Excellent. You, I, I mash just like you would. I mean, you know, the mashing process is the same no matter what kind of, of sparging you're doing. Um, the difference comes once your mash is converted and you're ready to run off. Um, I vorl off a bit, um, and one advantage of that braid is that it really produces uh, clean wort really, really quickly. Um, generally, a cup or two of vorl off is all that it takes me, uh, never more than two quarts. Yeah, can you mention what uh, vorl off is for those that might be unfamiliar uh, with the term? Sure. I mean, I know vorloff, what it is. But... <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Voloff is a, is a recirculation process. Basically, what you do is you run some wort out until it starts running clear. Now, clear doesn't mean so you can read a newspaper through it. Clear means so that there aren't any chunks in it. So once your, um, your wort is free of chunks of grain and stuff coming out, uh, I take that hose that's been running into a container. I use a, a little half gallon plastic pitcher. I put, I redirect that hose into the kettle, take the pitcher full of wort, and slowly pour that back over the top of the grain bed. So once you've got the Vorloff done and you're running into the kettle, um, you can do that as quickly as your system will allow. And this will be different from person to person, depending on exactly what your equipment is like, how fine your crush is. But unlike fly sparging, you don't need to go slowly. Uh, a lot of people think you have to go quickly. You don't. It's an advantage, not a requirement. Uh, once you have all that work run into your uh, kettle, um, I have, uh, while that's been going on, I've uh, heated up some water uh, in a, a seven-gallon uh, aluminum pot that I've got, uh, and I just pour that into the mash, uh, stir it thoroughly, and this is a, a key in the batch sparge. You, you have to stir that sparge water in thoroughly because what you're trying to do is get all the sugar into dilution, in, in that, into solution, excuse mm -hmm. me, in that water. And then you just do the Vorloff and runoff process again, just like you did with the mash. And that's it. You're good to go. You can start the boil and move on. Well, that's great, Denny. Um, you change the formulation of your recipe at all? You have to, you mentioned adding an extra pound of grain here and there, but, uh, but do you change anything when you, when you go to a batch sparge? No, nah, nothing at all. Nothing, nothing at, at all. all. Um, you know, no matter what kind of sparging you do, no matter what kind of system you use, you need to adjust any recipe for the efficiency of your system. Uh, a lot of people don't do that. They'll see a recipe online or in a book and they'll brew it 
and get a wildly different gravity than uh, the recipe states. But that's because, you know, you have to you have to personalize any recipe to some extent. But there are no changes you have to make specifically because you're batch sparging. Can you talk a minute about about efficiency? I mean, you just talked about uh, uh, how they how it changes a little bit from system to system, and uh, and a lot of th- you know one thing a lot of people are getting confused over is mash efficiency versus brew house efficiency. Can you talk for a minute about what those numbers different numbers mean? Sure, um, mash efficiency, um, <clears throat> sometimes called conversion efficiency, is how effectively you convert the sugars in the grain in your mash and you know how much doesn't actually undergo the conversion process from starch to sugar. Um, theoretically, you can get 100% conversion efficiency. Uh, if, if you're doing things right, you should definitely be up into the 90s anyway. Um, that's, you know, if if your water is right and your temperatures are right and your crush is right, that's a pretty normal thing. Um, and I should also mention that uh, you can read a lot more about this whole subject on uh, Kai Troister's website, which is browkaiser.com. Uh, so if you really want to get into depth in it, uh, check it out. He's done some amazing work. So that's your that's your mash efficiency or conversion efficiency. Um, Brew house efficiency uh, relates to um, how much of those sugars you actually get into your fermenter. Sometimes, uh, oh, there is Kai's website. Sometimes <laughs> uh, due to the fact that your kettle won't drain completely or that your mash tun won't drain completely or that you have more absorption by the hops than you were counting on. Um, You won't be able to get all the sugar you produce in your mash actually into your fermenter. Uh, So it's, that's what's referred to as brew house efficiency. Um, And uh, if, you know, if, if you're careful and you learn how to account for those kinds of losses, your brew house efficiency should be pretty darn close to what your mash efficiency is. So, um, so how does uh, how does batch sparging efficiency compare? You know, for brew house efficiency in this case uh, compare mm-hmm. against uh, against more traditional fly sparges. Um, you know, in in a theoretical sense, batch sparging will never be as efficient as a perfect fly sparge. Uh, I have never seen anybody who claimed to do a perfect fly sparge. Uh, In reality, batch sparging efficiency is equal to fly sparging efficiency, sometimes maybe even better. Uh, I know guys who have had not so great efficiency fly sparging, uh, maybe because of like a, a poorly designed laddering system, uh, they try batch sparging and their efficiency goes up 10 or 15 points. Now, I'm not about to claim that that's going to happen for everybody. But in general, if there's any efficiency hit at all in batch sparging, it is so small as, from my point of view, to, to be not worth worrying about uh, compared to the savings in equipment and time that you get. So uh, so you wrote a paper sometime back saying that the, the highest efficiency for batch sparging is actually reached when you get uh, what's called equal runnings. And I know a lot of people uh, try and get equal runnings when they're doing their batch sparge. Can you, can you walk us through that and what that means? And uh, I know you probably can't do all the math here, but, uh, but maybe refer us <laughs> to a website that has all the math. Yeah, um, the the math is on Ken Schwartz's website, and I I assume you'll post a link to that. Yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes, certainly. Uh, So for people who really want to geek out and find out why it is, and who are a lot smarter than I am at understanding that stuff, you can go there and look at all the math that Ken has done. He's uh, an engineer, and and, uh, he he really can prove his point with that. Um, But basically, equal runnings means that you get the same amount of wort out of your mash and your sparge. 
for instance, say that you were going to need a seven gallon boil volume, uh, you would get the best efficiency if you got three and a half gallons of that volume from the mash and another three and a half gallons from the sparge. Um, that's, it, it's rather nebulous though. Um, <laughs> I have generally found that if those two are within a gallon of each other, then you're good to go. There are um, ways to calculate how much sparge water and, and mash water to use. I mean, you mash with a certain ratio of, uh, you know, water to grain. Um, you um, account for the absorption of the grain to find, to figure out how much um, liquor you're going to be getting out of uh, your mash tun. And then uh, you can figure, uh, based on that, that you can subtract that from your total boil volume and uh, use that amount of sparge water. A lot of people, when they're first starting to brew all grain um, or do batch sparging, really don't know what to expect in terms of grain absorption and stuff like that. Uh, what kind of losses they'll have in their cooler for maybe like not being able to drain it fully. So there's a real easy, pragmatic way to do that. Um, mash with whatever ratio you like. I generally these days go someplace in the 1.6 quarts per pound of grain area. Mm -hmm. When you get that runoff from your mash tun into your kettle, just use your dipstick or the markings on your kettle or whatever to measure how much you have in the kettle and then simply subtract that from the amount that you want to boil and whatever answer you get is the amount of sparge water to use. Uh, unlike in fly sparging, ideally you want that mash tun to be pretty much dry when you finish your batch sparge. So you don't want to just put in a whole bunch of water. Uh, you want to try and make a guess as to the um, amount of water you need to get your boil volume and leave the mash tun dry at the end. So, you know, you can you can do it the, the easy pragmatic way, or once you have a handle on your uh, grain absorption and other losses, you can run the numbers and do it that way. And I oftentimes do a little bit of both. Now, Denny, what about working with big beers? I mean, what do you do in the case where you've got a mash tun that really is packed with grain? Uh, you end up doing, you know, multiple batches, uh, three, four batches, or, or how do you handle that situation? I never do three or four batches. Um, basically, one of the advantages of batch sparging that I didn't mention earlier is a, a pretty constant pH throughout the sparge. Um, some people hear that to mean you don't need to worry about mash pH and batch sparging. That's not true. You do need to worry about the mash pH and make sure that that's correct. But because you're not continually diluting the buffering power of the grain by running water through it like you do in your fly sparging, the pH of a batch sparge stays pretty darn constant uh, throughout the sparge. However, if you run enough water through that grain, you will start having pH problems. That's why I advise people to not do any more than two batch sparges. And to tell you the truth, most of the time I find that kind of pointless. Uh, there are people who uh, think, well, you know, I can get a little bit better efficiency if I batch sparge twice. And my experiments with that have led me to find that, that the efficiency goes up so little that it's really not worth the time and effort to do more than one batch sparge. Occasionally though, if I'm making a larger or larger size batch uh, or a, a higher gravity batch, I can't fit all that batch sparge water in my cooler at once. Right. Um, so what, what I'll do in that case then is put in as much as I can and then kind of do a, a combination of fly and batch sparging um, in that I will then just kind of as, as space becomes available in the cooler, I'll just start pouring in more water. You could do it, and I do sometimes, not often, but sometimes 
do a complete drain um, of the cooler and then do another separate batch sparge too. If it takes more than two batch sparges, I tell people, go buy a bigger cooler. Um, <laughs> a, a, a couple of friends and I get together uh, once a year and uh, brew up a 10 gallon batch of barley wine. We used to do that in uh, two coolers, making five gallons in each one. And these suckers, you know, were full to the brim, so you could hardly stir. We were having to do multiple sparges in each cooler. And eventually I went out and I bought a 152 quart cooler that will take 75 pounds of grain and a quart and a half a pound and have room to spare in it. So you know, that's the pragmatic solution there. <laughs> Sounds like a good suggestion. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would say don't beat yourself up. And if you're doing more than two batch sparges, go get a bigger cooler. And in general, you should never even need to do two. So, Danny, aside from fly and batch sparging, what are some other techniques that people use for, uh, for sparging these days? Well, no sparge is uh, getting a lot, of, uh, a lot of publicity these days, and it's a, a great technique. Uh, it ostensibly uh, makes a maltier beer. Um, George Fix even uh, claimed that back many years ago. Um, I, you know... That's a hard claim to prove because it's pretty subjective. Um, I feel like batch sparging gives a, a better malt flavor to the beer for the same reason that no sparge does. But I'm never going to try and convince anybody of that, again, because it's so subjective that it's really, really hard to prove. Um, a lot of people are doing brew in the bag these days. Uh, but that, you know, a brew in a bag, you can do no sparge, fly sparge, or batch sparge. It's just kind of up to you. Uh, so, I mean, basically your three options are no sparge, fly sparge, and batch sparge. Makes sense. Um, so if somebody's, if somebody's looking to make that leap, that first cha leap from uh, extract to all green, what, what kind of advice would you have for them, Denny? Um, number one, keep it simple. Um, you don't need to have equipment like a commercial brewery to brew really good beer. Uh, number two, get online. There's tons of brewing forums out there. Uh, ask questions. If there's somebody around you who brews all grain, see if you can go and watch them brew. Um, although, it's amazingly easy. I had never seen anyone do it when I did it. I had just read about it, uh, talked to people online. Um, and I had, I, I teach a lot of people how to brew all grain and batch sparge and stuff. And almost without exception, when we get done, they look at me and go, is that it? You know, <laughs> it, it is so easy. There's nothing to it. So, you know, keep it simple ask questions to get prepared, uh, take really, really good notes because chances are something will go wrong and you'll need to figure out what it is and correct it next time. And even if nothing does go wrong, you still want to document what you did so you can do, do it again. And the, the number one thing is don't freak out. You're going to make beer. You're going to have a good time. If your temperature is off, if you're not getting the gravities you want, don't worry about it. Take notes. Write down what you're doing. When you get done, sit down, have a beer, think it through, and plan what you're going to do the next time. Uh, you know, it's, it's, as they say in the Ronco ads, it's just that easy. Now, while I got you on the line, you just got back from beer camp, and I was wondering if you could uh, just say a few words about your experience at beer camp. It's going to be hard to just say a few words. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, I was I was fortunate enough to be invited to Sierra Nevada's beer camp along with uh, a group of people who had posted questions on the AHA discussion forum that uh, Sierra Nevada ran a contest to ask a question. If they think it's a really great question, they'll invite you to beer camp. And then there was uh, an, another gentleman there who had been the California Home Brewer of the Year three times by uh, winning all three of the largest competitions in California. 
And he had done it not once, but three times. That just blows me away. So basically, Sierra Nevada invites you to come down, and they treat you like the biggest VIPs in the world. Uh, You spend uh, the first day meeting with the brewmaster uh, of the pilot brewery there. They have a a 10-barrel pilot brewery that pretty much mimics in a small way the, the, the big brewery. So you meet with him and you talk about a recipe that you want to brew the next day. We came up with what we were calling an American alt beer. Then you spend the day touring the brewery and learning about Sierra Nevada. And it's an amazing setup they have there. Uh, And besides making really, really good beer, they have an amazing environment or a commitment to the environment and the community. They have 10,000 solar panels. They have fuel cells. They generate about 90% of the energy, or about 70% of the energy they use. And I believe they said that they recycle or reuse 99.7% of all their uh, their waste material coming out of there. So, uh, you know, you get a real in-depth tour of the brewery uh, in all aspects. You spend time in the uh, quality control lab. Um, the next day, you get up and... Uh, the uh, plan was to brew uh, two 10-barrel batches of uh, our recipe. Uh, Scott Jennings, the pilot brewery brewmaster, had already uh, mashed in one of them by the time we got there, but we got to uh, grind grain and weigh hops and stuff like that for the second batch. Um, and, you know, during the day, you're doing more brewery tours. Um, one of the highlights of the whole thing was at the end of the second day, they uh, handed us a uh, a box of gallon size Ziploc baggies and set us loose in their hop freezer. Uh, <laughs> wow! Uh, there was a, a woman there who was with her husband, and she looked around and said, "I've never seen men shop so fast." <laughs> uh, but it was fantastic. it was an amazing experience. Uh, you know, they uh, they invite certain people. It's usually it's usually distributors, reps bartenders, things like that. They were really jazzed to have people there who knew about brewing so they didn't have to explain how the mash worked and all that kind of thing. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's you can submit a video to get to go, and I would encourage anyone who, uh, who wants to do it to go to the website. I think it's called sierrabeercamp.com. Uh, read the rules for submitting a video and do it because it's the experience of a lifetime. Well, thank you, Denny. Is there is there anything else you'd like to add? You know, the one thing I would like to do is invite everybody to come to the National Homebrew Conference in Seattle, uh, June 21st through 23rd. Uh, the conferences have just been getting better and better every year. We've got some big things planned. Uh, I'm the guy lining up speakers, and we have some great speakers, including this guy named Brad Smith. Yeah, I'm going to be there. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. well, we look forward to having you there, too. It's going to be a great conference. We have some extraordinary activities planned. Uh, The uh, registration and hotel reservations open on February 1st, and you can check the website at ahaconference.org. And just keep abreast of the details on the conference. And I hope I'll see everybody there. I'll definitely put a link to that in the show notes as well, Denny. Thanks. You bet. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Denny, thank you so much for being on the show. It's It's been great having you. It's been a real pleasure, Brad. Uh, it's always a pl- pleasure chatting with you. And uh, I hope that people have, uh, you know, can get some good info out of this. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can email me at beerguy, that's B-E-E-R-G-U-I, at cvcable.com. Well, I I, uh, I encourage everybody to email Denny as soon as you listen to the show. He'll appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> you get a couple thousand emails right off the bat. So that's okay, man. I didn't say how long it would take me to answer him. That, that was the, uh, the great Denny Khan. He is a uh, uh, governing committee member of the American Homebrewers Association. He's the chair of this year's uh, uh, conference committee in terms of uh, lining up speakers. And he also runs a little website at dennybrew.com where you can learn more about uh, batch sparging.
Thanks, Denny. Sure, Brad. I think that, that went really fun. well. Yeah, you did a great job, and it was about 35 minutes, uh, uh, practically perfect, and 